We're now going to move on to a question around um, high cost credit. Um, I was just to give a little bit of background to this question. I was uh, interested in uh, on, on Dominique's slides about uh, the uh, micro credit personnel being lower than five thousand euros. Um, normally, um, we've had a government programme recently in the UK called the Financial Inclusion Growth Fund, which has enabled people on low incomes to obtain credit that they wouldn't normally be able to get. Uh, the average loan on that scheme, and there were hundreds of thousands of loans made, um, was £400, so that's no more than €500. Euros. So we're talking about very low-value loans. Often, one of the justifications of the guys that uh, Mick spoke about, the high-cost lenders, for charging high rates is that they say that these low-value loans, whether it's £50, £100, £200, are expensive to administer and they're also high risk. Therefore, we will justify higher charges and higher costs on lower-value loans to lower-income to lower income people on the grounds of enabling people to obtain credit. So this is a question for Mick. It's a good question for Mick, actually. This, I'm sure he'll give a good answer to this one. Is about... Can high cross credit ever be justified, for the reasons I've just said? And what's meant by high cost anyway? What do we mean by high cost? Um, Edgar worried about 35% APR. In many places, that would be low cost. Um, uh, and what's a reasonable rate of interest on loans under 1,000 euros? So that's a good one. Over to you, Mick. Good. Do we have, can I have the rest of the afternoon to answer this question? You know, it's, uh, I, I thought I was answering the question about the role of government. I came prepared for that one. You know, but anyway, so I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to think up an answer now. Then, yeah. Uh, anyway, so is, is high cost credit ever justified? Probably not. You know, it's really, really difficult to think of a of a of a of a, of a circumstance where it is better to encourage someone who's already in financial difficulty to get into more financial difficulty by taking out high cost credit. You know, that, is the, that is the simple logic behind my proposal that the first thing we have to do is to control the supply of high cross credit. It does not make any sense to encourage people in difficulty into further difficulty. That's the, that's the, start of, that's, that's the starting proposition. Now, there may, well be, there may well be circumstances where people are desperate for credit because they have to face, uh, you know, they have to pay a utility bill or, or whatever. But again, it doesn't make sense to encourage people or, or allow them to take out high cost credit to pay a bill that they're behind with, you know, if, if, if they're facing, uh, if they're behind on their, their payments. The way you address that problem is to force the utility companies to treat them fairly and actually, you know, be a bit, be a bit, more, uh, be a bit more sympathetic about the, about the debt. You do, not, you, you do not solve that problem by creating another problem. So that's, again, there, there is no logic behind encouraging high-cost credit to solve another particular problem. So then we come on to the, we, we, then we come on to the question, well, what, what constitutes you know, a reasonable cost for credit? Now, the, now the, 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 you know, I mean, if you listen to the, the payday lenders or the subprime lenders in the UK, they, they will convince you, they will persuade you that they are some form of social service, you know, that they are there to help vulnerable communities. And it's just a sort of a very unfortunate side effect that they have to charge these high high rates. Of course, it's actually nonsense. The reasons why the reasons why they charge these high interest rates is very very simple. It's because of their business models. You know, there, there are three reasons why they charge these high rates. Well, the first one is that there's a certain type of lender whose business model is entirely based on aggressive selling of credit using agents. So therefore, they go door to door to try to sell credit. That is a very, very expensive form of distribution. The economics of distribution mean, by definition, the cost of that credit will be very high. So it's not the consumer's fault that the cost of credit is high. It's because the chosen business model means the cost of credit will be very high in that case. The second reason is there's, there's another form of business model which is ma uh, mainly based around advertising, you know, television advertising. You know, the advertising budgets of the newer subprime or payday lenders in the UK, the advertising budgets are vast, and they are expensive. 
Therefore, they have to charge high rates to pay for their advertising budgets. For a very simple reason, the purpose of the advertising budget is to uh, persuade more people to take out credit. It's not to persuade people to take out credit that suits them, it's to persuade people to take out more credit. That's the basis and the reason, the reason behind the expensive advertising campaigns. Advertising is costly, therefore that increases the cost of credit. Now the third sort of alternative really is that the, re the third reason why the, why the cost of credit is so high in this sector is that most of these guys don't actually perform meaningful credit checks on the people they are lending to, but they don't have to worry about that because, very simply, they charge very, very high rates to compensate for the risk of default. So, therefore, they don't have to take the risk of people not repaying. The risk is actually transferred onto the borrower, to the vulnerable borrower. That's why the rates are actually so high. It's not because it's not because the risk of the consumer per se is to support the chosen business models of the payday lenders. So what is that? What is actually a reasonable rate then? Now in, in, in the in the UK, I'm sure many of you will know that um, as it stands, the uh, the, the government uh, uh, um, uh, caps the, the 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 rate the credit unions can charge. I think it's still is it still two percent a month? Is it? Yep. But there is a there is a proposal uh, out for discussion. Which, which proposes that credit unions should be allowed to charge 3% a month for their loans. That's a cap now. You know, that, is not a, that is not a sort of minimum. That is a cap. Many credit unions will actually charge below that. But I actually think, I think that's a reasonable rate of, uh, a reasonable cost for credit for a very simple reason. If you, if you look at the economics of distribution, again, it all comes down to the economics of distribution here. If you actually look at 3%, I think it would actually allow the most efficient credit unions to expand their services, it would actually allow them to create economies of scale, which would make the lending sustainable, not sort of one-off lending or sort of patchy lending. It would actually make the lending sustainable. So that seems to me is a, to, to be a sort of a reasonable, a reasonable cost of credit. But I come back to this point. Even if you allow credit unions to charge 3% a month, they will not work unless you squeeze the supply of predatory lending. Nothing else gets a chance to breathe in the sunlight unless you squeeze the supply of the dangerous credit or the toxic credit. That is the first thing you have to do. Control the, the supply of bad credit, then you allow the supply of good credit to bloom in vulnerable communities. That's what you have to do. And I'm afraid there, you know, there, there are many ways of doing that, I mean, and I won't go into them, but, but one, a very, very contentious issue is the issue of uh, capping the charges that the payday lenders charge. And to me, it just seems illogical that you have community lenders, good lenders, have their interest rates capped, yet the payday lenders don't have their charges capped. And the, people are always saying, well, there's a risk that if you cap charges, people will be pushed into the hands of the, what is it, David called it, the grey market, what we call the illegal lending sector. There is a risk, I mean, let, let's be honest, there is a risk that some people will be pushed into the hands of the illegal lending sector. But to my mind, that risk is far outweighed by the benefits of supply, uh, controlling the supply of credit to vulnerable community, uh, communities for all the reasons that I said in my first intervention. This is an extractive industry that predates on vulnerable communities. So controlling the supply of credit through uh, charge caps, I think, has more benefits than risks. And I'll leave you with one other statistic. that um, There was some research done in the UK a, a while ago and it actually found that around half of the people who actually used credit in the grey market had previously been clients of the legal subprime lenders, the regulated subprime lenders. So I'm afraid the argument that the regulated lenders act as some kind of bulwark or protection against the illegal sector, I'm afraid it just isn't borne out by the evidence. Quite often it's, a, it's like a conveyor belt. You start off in the mainstream lending sector, you end up in the subprime lending sector, then you end up in the illegal sector. So I'm afraid these guys don't perform a social service as they, as they try to claim.